Okay, welcome to Picklehead Podcast. Pickleheads, super excited to have you guys. Um, today we're just going to be talking about, we're going to do a tournament recap on my weekend. I played in a 5.5 tournament. Spencer's going to ask me some questions and yeah, we're going to go over them, so it's going to be pretty fun. I wanted to start with a little story today, a little story time. <laughs> Spencer said he has a little story too and that we might have the same story. But um, I bet we do, because <laughs> he was a part of it. So uh, a couple weeks back during the PPA Vegas uh, tournament, whatever it's called, open. Uh, in Vegas, for, for whatever reason, there's not enough pickleball courts as pickleball players. Unless you want to drive like 45 minutes from wherever your location is. There's only one spot that will have enough. And then even then, it's still pretty iffy if you get a court. And it's in is, the ghetto. Yeah, and it's in the ghetto. You get you get homeless. Like, we went to this, what's it called? Sunset, Sunset Park? Yeah. We went there one morning. We got there at 6 a.m. when I was visiting. And <laughs> this is a different story. <laughs> and Spencer went to the bathroom. I went and got a court. And uh, <laughs> as he's going to the bathroom, all of a sudden, someone, like, moaned from a stall. Yeah. There was a homeless <laughs> guy in there. He was just laying down in a stall, right? Yeah. <laughs> Trying to keep warm. So that's how it goes down there. <laughs> Anyways. Poor guy. But, Vegas. yeah, it's covered with homeless people all around the courts. Yeah. So it's like, is it even worth it to go there? And plus, it's a 50-50 if you're going to get a court. And then anywhere that's within you know, 10 to 15 minutes is absolutely packed during any hours that like work is done. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. So anytime that we want to play there, we're like, there's n not really any option other than the 55 plus community. <laughs> okay. And so that's what we did. There's this 55 plus community that's super, super nice. And <laughs> the way that you get in is we all hop in Spencer's truck. <laughs> and we wait for someone to go through this this gate, and then we just r ride in right behind them, and then we go play pickleball. And so we waited probably like two minutes, and then someone someone drove through the gate. Spencer slammed on the gas as fast as he could. We got behind this car. We get in. We're with my wife, who's playing with us, my dad, and it, then it's me and Spencer. And my dad is obviously over 55. So we're like, hey, your name is Thad. Your name's Thaddeus. <laughs> we came up with that name. <laughs> and we need to figure out where you live. So we went and drove to a road and we were like, okay, Woodburn. Your 1528 Woodburn Drive. <laughs> and your name's Thaddeus. <laughs> and so we start playing, right? And uh, as, as we get to playing, it's me and my dad versus my wife and Spencer. And uh, Spencer shouts out right before my dad's about to serve. He says, let's go, fatty. That's what we all hear is let's go, fatty. <laughs> and so we're thinking, did he just call him fat? <laughs> Anyways, my dad is absolutely shook. He's shell-shocked, okay? <laughs> he, he serves the ball. It, it doesn't even hit the net. It was so short. <laughs> he, he is like so deep in his head. Uh, come to find out, he called him Thaddy, short for Thaddeus. T-H, right? yeah. So he now has a nickname. <laughs> so it, it feels like, oh, man, I thought you called me Fatty. It was so funny. <laughs> And then this, this random lady in the 55 plus community shows up and she's just like eyeing us. She's taking pictures of our plates. We're like, it's time to get out of here. <laughs> We'd only played like two games at that point. And so we start heading out and my dad's in the lead. And we're like, hey, Phil, your name's Thaddeus. Like we, we have all of we this We got down. the address. Don't screw <laughs> this up. <laughs> 1528 Woodburn. Let's do this. <laughs> So we start walking out and the lady's like, sir, do, do you live here? And he's like, no. <laughs> <laughs> he just says no. We're like, oh, dear. Well, that went against plan protocol. I'm like, let's get in the car and let's get out of here as quickly as we can. So I just like, I'm not talking to anybody. And anyways, my dad, the guy that he is, he's just super good at communicating with people. So he talked with him for a while, worked it out with him. 
and then we were able to stay and continue playing. <laughs> Got some good footage. It, it was a fun night, but it was actually a really long night. I remember we were like, we were playing our last game, and we were like, why are we even doing this? Everybody was just exhausted. Delirious <laughs> by the end. Yeah, it was yeah. comical. But it was worth it. We were like, hey, this is our last time. We're going to be in here. Has like a view of this city. It was absolutely beautiful. <laughs> but yeah, it was a good experience. I wanted to share that story. What story were you going to share? No, it wasn't that one. So mine's oh, actually related to to the topic at hand, which was your tournament. I kind of want to ask you about it and focus this podcast on how to win a pickleball tournament um, because there are a lot of factors involved. But my story is, I'm going to, I guess, tell the end from the beginning. Let's just spill the beans now. Austin in men's doubles, won the 5-5 five, five, five tournament. So he's in the gold medal match. I didn't have the opportunity to attend. I'm in Vegas. I had some other things going. Um, but uh, my mom was texting the score. Every time the score changed, she was giving me a text update in the gold medal match. And mind you, this was just one match to 15. But not only was she texting me the score and I was getting it delayed, she was texting me it backwards at times. And so <laughs> yeah. it was way, way worse doing it that way because every second I'm waiting for a text and she would say zero three or first one she said three zero. And then right after that she said, I mean zero three. And then she'd say three one. I mean oh, one three. <laughs> <laughs> and then she kept, you know, and I'm sitting here waiting, waiting all the way up to 15. But it was kind of cool because I could see your your comeback in that match because you guys were down, I want to say like 1-6 at one point. It seemed like to me from what she was texting me because it was a little bit jumbled. It was nice of her to do that, by the way. And, yeah, uh, that's correct. But then you could see your score scores slightly tighten up i think it got to like nine nine to where it was like competitive and then you guys really started to pull away from from there but that was a fun way to not watch but listen and follow a pickleball match um but i did get to see some footage of some earlier matches so that was a blast uh yeah i, yeah, I was man. going i was gonna live stream it but then i was like i just feel like that added pressure I don't need right now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's yeah. just win this thing. Because just to give a quick recap of, of the day, we got into our f very first match of the day. We came in pretty cold. We felt like we were warmed up, right? We, we warmed up for 30 minutes, so we should be warm. But I, I feel like that's just how I am. And I, whenever I get into my first game of the day, I'll just make simple mistakes that I don't make the rest of the day. So we get into our first match, and we literally lost. We went out in two sets. They beat us in two sets. It was two games. Nine, yeah, two games, yeah. This isn't tennis. <laughs> it was 9-11, 7-11. Uh, I'm pretty sure it was around that score. So we lose, and I'm like, it's going to be a long day because we'll see this team again in the gold medal match. And that's, that's literally what I said to my partner, and I 100% believed it because I'm like, it was just a rough rough couple of games we had no reason to lose my partner missed three returns in the second game I missed like where I'm covering middle I missed in the net just in the net forehand smashes three or four yeah and it's just like that that gave the game away 100 percent. and so it's at that point I was just like you just move on from it and don't think about it the rest of the day so then the rest of the day, it's matches to 15 because we just went to the consolation bracket and now we have a chance to make it to the bronze medal match and then the gold medal match. So we get into our second game. We won 15-1. Um, pretty, pretty standard pickleball. We played decent. I still didn't feel like I played my best. My partner was on fire and he was on fire the rest of the day. He was absolutely legit. And then we played... Uh, a tennis team. They had just come from tennis. Definitely shouldn't have been in the 5-5 five -five bracket. They're probably around the 4-0 range. All they did was drive. That was my worst game of the day, and we won 15-7. It was the worst I played by far. <laughs> and then 
We got into our next one, and we played the team that we lost to first round. That's the one I watched. Yeah. Played the team that we lost to first round, and we just... We, we played... My partner played lights out. I felt like I played decent. I had some... I played on the most important points. I played really well, which is what matters the most. And we beat them. I think it was 15-10. And then we got into our next one, which was our toughest match of the day, probably, other than the final. And that was the highest rated team. We played uh, Eric Gubler and Tyler Holbrook. And we were up 15-7. At 14-7, obviously not 15-7. And they came back. Uh, Tied it to, at 14, right? To 14 all. Yeah, we just <laughs> fell apart. It was so bad. I had a forehand. They popped a forehand down the middle. I'm about to take it. My partner's backhand's there. It's closer to his backhand. So I'm like, go, go, go. And he's like, go, go, go at the same time. <laughs> right past us. And that was, at, that was when we were up 14-8. And so could have put it away right there. Didn't. Now the pressure is building up, and then it's just like, hey, it's time to be a man, you know? It's time to <laughs> take the bull by the horns, and let's finish this thing off. So this was really cool, and it's it's a cool mental tactic to use. But we got to 14-14. They're serving on two. I'm returning, and only way that you're going to win is if you swing, okay? You can't, you can't poke the return back and hope that it goes in. So I'm fully committed. I smack my knee. I'm in the zone. <laughs> Right, That's the signal to myself that everything that's happened before doesn't matter. It's gone from my brain, and I'm just focused on this next point. I return the shot. I'm swinging away. Okay, Great deep return. They miss the third. And that's what happens because I played balls to the walls. Right, I'm, I'm in it. I'm playing. I'm, I'm just playing. Right, I'm swinging. I'm not yeah. scared. I'm not scared of losing. I am playing to win. Okay, So then we get back to 14-14. And I say to my partner, Logan, we're shaking and baking this shiz, okay? <laughs> we're swinging away. Every shot, we're just going to hit it. And I'm going to set you up. If, if it comes to me, I'm setting you up, and I want you to hit the, a volley as hard as you possibly can. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> he serves the ball. They, they missed the return. So I was like, wow, they're feeling the pressure, right? One more. So, so one more, right? Um, we end up, I think, from what I remember, uh, we end up missing the drive. Next one, I say, okay, shake and bake again. Let's do it. I want you to hit it as hard as you can. I serve the ball. They return up the middle. I, I've been playing left the whole week, so I'm on the left, so I'm ready to hit this middle ball. And I say, rush the net, hit it as hard as you can. I swing away. He rushes the net. I've never seen a more disgusting volley in my entire life. <laughs> He hits this thing literally as hard as he can. Clean winner. <laughs> Should you ever hit a volley that hard? Probably not, but he did. Because we were playing to win. We were out there to win, yeah. not, to, not to just stay alive, right? And that's what took us to the top there. We should have won 15-7. Ended up winning 16-14. Sometimes that's how it is. Uh, the pressure gets to you. But if you come out willing to swing and willing to play to win, you win. Next next game was our uh, bronze medal match. We won 15-3, I think. We're just playing lights out. That was the very first game that I had actually played good. It was the bronze medal <laughs> match. I was like, I can't miss. <laughs> yeah. My partner was still playing good, had been playing good all day. And then we got into the gold medal match. Tricky part about this one is our opponents hadn't missed, uh, hadn't lost a game all day. So we had to beat them two out of three, and then we had to beat them in a game to 15. So the odds are stacked against us. It's really hard to beat someone once two out of three, um, but we knew we could do that. And then to beat them in a game to 15, beating them twice is a lot more difficult. Uh, so we get into the two out of three. And we're like, hey, we're taking this in straight. We're swinging away. We're not pushing any balls. Everything we're swinging, any opportunity we're swinging, that's exactly what we did. We won the first game 11 3. Won the second game 11 7. Yeah, that's what I remember. And then the third game we got into, and not to be too long winded, but we, we got down. We were swinging away, but we were missing. We never pushed once, so we knew that eventually these shots are going in, right? So we got down 1 6. You switch at 8, 
So we wanted to make sure we beat them to eight, but we're not thinking beat them to eight, beat them to eight. We're just thinking swing, mm-hmm. like just play your game, play to win. Let's go. We have faster hands than these guys. They don't stand a chance against us. They're feeling the pressure. We're not. So then we, we beat them to eight. We got to eight, six. We did, we reeled off seven straight points, did the changeover. Uh, they got up eight, 10, and then we beat them 15, 10. And just came down to continuously swinging, trusting our hands, trusting our dinks, trusting the partner. And uh, yeah, so that's a recap on the day. It was super fun, fun to lose first round and then come back and win, get the dub. Yeah. Yeah, playing to win, I think, should be the the entire point of this uh, podcast today. So I know some of our viewers um, and listeners have not played any tournaments at all. And there's others that have played tournaments and know the experience. Or maybe some of them have played tournaments in, in other sports. So you have nerves involved. Um, but I think playing to win is huge, and we can we can come back to that. But let me explain first the level us. So for any uh, beginners out there, there are levels in pickleball. Typically, like the lowest level someone is, I would say, is like a 2-0. Um, if, you're, if you're below 2-0, like you'd have to purposely try to be there. I don't know. <laughs> All right. And then 2-5. Um, I, a lot of tournaments don't have anything below a two, five to even play in. Some of them only have a three O and up to play in. So three O being the most beginner level. Then there's three, five, four, four, five, five. Typically five is the highest at the amateur level. Uh, this one was, I'll call it a special tournament where they had a, a five, five tournament, which is, which is five O plus. Uh, which is dope. So that was your first five five that you've ever played in, correct? And that was the first five five, yeah. Yeah. Um, you've won multiple five O's, first five five. Anyway, just an idea of where the level is. Uh one more idea of where it's at. So pro level is typically anything above five O. Most women are five O plus, maybe just below six. Um and then there's lots of pro males that are 60 plus kind of pushing that pushing that 7 the very top in the world i think ben johns is actually just barely over 7 in his duper ranking right now um but anyway just to get an idea of what level you played at but regardless of the level that you're playing at you can have nerves at a tournament uh, the first point that you brought up, boss, let's talk about this for a second, warming up for a tournament. Um, even the best player in the world starts out really slow, and I know he needs a lot of warm-up, and he needs a lot of matches to play in, and that's Ben Johns. If you're going to beat him, it's typically at the very beginning of the day, um, because it takes a while for him to warm up. I'm the same exact way. I have to warm up for a long time. The best I've ever done in a tournament is when I show up at like at least an hour early and get reps in. Even if I can get like a mock rec game in before the tournament, yeah, that's when I'm like really warmed up and feeling a lot better. And it helps. It's one way to kind of get rid of the nerves too. And that way when you start your first match, you're like, well, I already played a match in a way. You know, I'm completely warmed up. I got my game going. Um, but it can be a slow start for some. So I would suggest to anyone, I guess what I'm suggesting right now is best thing you can do at the beginning of a tournament is show up super early, find a court, drill everything that you can, and maybe get a rec game in before if, if you can. Or at least, uh, you know, a skinny singles or something to get the blood flowing and make sure that you're well warmed up with all your shots before you, you know, start to play your next round. I know plenty of people that show up late or show up just on time and they're not ready to go, and that's a good time to take advantage of that team and and put them away from the very beginning. Um, Something to add to that, Oz? Yeah, it's kind of interesting because I hate warming up. I just, I don't enjoy it at all. (laughs) I, I just want to get in and play, you know? 
Yeah. And it really feels really forced when I have to warm up, but it's definitely worth it. It makes it a lot easier. What was interesting is this is the first tournament. I've been so concentrated on content creation that I haven't cared at all about playing in tournaments, right? So this is the first tournament that I've played in since April, since April time. And um, playing in it, I kind of forgot uh, like my attitude on the court and how I play and how I excel the most, like what my attitude should be in order for me to excel the most. There's this guy named Kai McMakin. He's a 5'5 plus player and he's out of California and he's just like a light on the court. Cowboy? The whole time. Yeah. Okay. Kai the Cowboy. Yeah, 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 yeah. Look him up, watch any any game with him. He just like amps up his partner the whole time and he's bouncing around the court and he's laughing. It's, I mean, even playing against him is the funnest thing ever. <laughs> Even if you lose, you're just like, this dude's just awesome. Yeah. I, I really like him. But for some people, they're just pissed at him. Like, oh, yeah, he's so happy. He talks after every point mm -hmm. and they don't like him. <laughs> but I loved it. Um, so it was like figuring out what my on court antics are in order for me to excel. I just had kind of forgotten. And when I, I play my best, when I'm just calm, cool, collected, and relaxed. It's like literally after every point. The way that I like to view it, honestly, is, and who's helped me a ton, is Travis Rettenmeyer, the way that he plays. If you watch him after any point, dude's arms just go straight to his side, and he's just like dragging his feet to the baseline. <laughs> and that's how I, I, that's how I play in between points. So I'm like dragging my feet to the baseline, super relaxed, super chill, and then I just have a whip right? My forehand drives are a whip. My drops are a whip. They're, everything's going in and I just feel relaxed as I'm playing. That's how I excel. Some players, it's like they excel just by shouting, uh, getting super amped after points, right? Which I like to get amped after really good points sometimes, but for the most part, I just keep it chill, keep it relaxed. And I just, I play my best pickleball. And then I'll also play my best pickleball if I can talk to slash coach my partner which not sure if they like it the most but it helps me play better <laughs> yeah but what i mean by coach is i'm just saying like stay relaxed swing away and then it helps me stay relaxed and swing away too even though they probably already know that because it's the 87th time that i've said it but it's like hey we're, we're winning together so you can't be that mad yeah but i think it's it's finding your on on court what's the word i'm looking for your on court personality attitude um attitude let's do attitude yeah it's finding your on-court attitude that helps you to excel and that could be julian arnold where you're shouting on diamo after every point and that <laughs> helps you play better yeah. which does not for me if i get amped up i get tight um it could be like the ben johns or the travis rettenmeyer where you're just kind of chill after points you're super relaxed um and, th and then one more thing is having a reset button I'd hit a shot in the net, right? And there's nothing more painful than just hitting a shot in the net that you should have put away. I think that's my least favorite thing in the world. Yeah. Is having a reset and I'd smack my leg. And then the tension in my eyebrows where I'm like making a crown with my eyebrows, right? <laughs> yeah. Prior. As soon as I smack, relaxed. The eyebrow tension goes away. And then I just, I play excellent pickleball. So... That is what it comes down to. What, what I was going to say, though, sorry, I know this is long-winded. Very first game of the day, though, I had forgotten that was my persona on the court. Yeah. And I was playing as, like, that jumpity, hippity, hoppity guy. <laughs> and it wasn't helping my partner, and it wasn't helping me, and I never played good. And then I was, next game, I just stayed super chill, and I played well, and then I did that the rest of the day. So find that on-court persona, and, and you'll play really well. Yeah, and I think the best way to find that, you make a really good point, is, see, I don't do well, well, at times, I guess I do, like, screaming after a point and pumping myself up. It seems to bring my adrenaline way up, but then, you know, a point or two after that, my, it seems like my body, my shots don't function properly like they should, maybe because yeah. my adrenaline is so high. 
So for people to find what their encore attitude should be at their peak or what's best for them, I would suggest the best way to find it is to actually sign up for a tournament and play it. If you lose your first tournament, oh well. In the grand scheme of things, no one cares. But look what you can gain from it. I've gained a lot from losing multiple tournaments. And then I've been able to find like what works best for me. For example, something that works best for me for a tournament is I have to get some form of exercise before before I play. Um, typic- right. Typically, that's running. Um, as you know, Oss, and maybe some of the viewers know, I run every day, and that's like my start for the day. That's how I get relaxed. Um, that's how I'm not just crazy amped up and not able to perform is if I get my run in. If I don't get some form of exercise like that before I play, um, I look like James Ignatowicz out there and I'm just hopping around all (laughs) over and I can't really control my nerves or anything else. So for me, it's good to to get that. But for other people, it might not be at all. Some people don't want to do that and that makes sense for them and for their routine. But to find out your routine to find out what your encore attitude should be when you play at your best, I would say the best way to do that is to actually play a tournament and then play another tournament and and you'll be able to figure out what's best for you. And then one more thing, you mentioned pumping up your partner or talking to your partner. That's huge in this, in doubles pickleball. Singles is a different thing. You can pump up yourself mentally. But if you want your partner to perform well, you got to figure out what's best for them. But you also got to just try to stay positive with them. Like I've played with partners, for example, playing with my wife. I've learned over time and I've learned the hard way. It's best for me if we're playing a match and it's competitive and we want to win. It's best for me to not say one word. Not say anything positive to her and not say anything negative to her. Like I've learned with her, that's the best way during the match. But with other people that I've played with, they like to be pumped up. You know, I've played with partners where I'll I'll, I'll really pump their ego while they're playing and I can tell if they have a really good shot. You know, I'll say, easy, Ben Johns. We're not trying to destroy these guys. Just beat them. You know what I mean? And some, some partners really thrive off of that. And so you got to figure that out. Like I like being pumped up too. Not too pumped to where I can't play, but I like the positive comments. When you're in a team sport like that, it's just huge. If you want to win, you and your partner both need to be on the same page and both need to perform well. So, I love that. It's interesting because my least favorite type of partner to play with is someone where I compliment them and they say like, and they reject the compliment. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like good, good playing in the second half of that match or whatever, and they're just like, "No, nah, bro, don't lie." Like that was horrible. <laughs> yeah. I'm just like, you're just, you're not a winner. You're not gonna win if you can't accept a compliment. Yeah, like that's my least favorite. My favorite is people that I can just that accept the compliment. And playing with Logan this this last weekend, it was just. I, you just being genuine with him, like, dude, that was the most disgusting shot I've ever seen in my life. I don't know how you did that. Yeah. He had this, this speed up where he's been practicing it. It looks like it's going down the line and then he whips it, um, up the middle because he was playing on the right side. He hit, I want to say near 10 winners, straight up winners (laughs) down the middle on this speed up. And it's funny, like the matches that we did film, the players will come back to the fence and they'll be like, bro, that's your middle backhand. Like, why aren't you there? <laughs> it's like, you guys got to understand, this guy is whipping something out that not even pros are doing. <laughs> yeah, He's made this up and it, it works super well. So I'm going to try to learn that on backhand and forehand side too. Um, but it's it's a legit shot. Just from the little bit that I watched, I could tell that he was super positive too. Um, posi- positivity is just so huge in pickleball. You just have to be positive, even if you're not playing well. If if you if you're not playing well and you want to continue playing bad, be negative. If you want to f- eventually find that 
you know, that positive play, you got to have the positive attitude. I saw one shot of his too, where, where you hit a, I call it a PA, premature attackulation, and their counter was to him, and he did a jumping backhand okay. and just put the ball away. Uh, <laughs> both of you guys had some incredible shots. Like it was super fun to watch at at such a high level, but. If you're if you're constantly pumping someone's ego, they're they're gonna play better. Um, for the most part, again, understand your partner. Play a lot with your partner. Understand what's best for them. I guarantee anyone you play with, though, if you're negative with them, it's you're gonna get a negative result. But yeah. but at the same time, again, for example, like my wife. She doesn't really like when I say anything when we're in that play. When we're drilling and I'm tr- and she's trying to get better, that's when I coach. Yeah, uh, we've talked about this before on the podcast. Um, coaching your partner during play. If you guys have practiced something before and they're not doing that in in the match, um, maybe you could briefly mention, you know in a nice way or a positive way remember if this happens then this super quick or something like that but for the most part i would suggest not coaching your partner in a tournament it's not the time to do it the coaching should have happened before and uh it can take place again after but it's just it can really mess with somebody's game if you're trying to coach your partner during a tournament and I know that you agree with that, but what do you have to add to that? Yeah, it's just um, what we mean by coaching is like, okay, hey, on your forehand, you need to make sure that you're following the shot and following your paddle as you hit the forehand. Like that's coaching, right? Yeah. But saying something like as simple as swing away on that shot, like don't push, isn't necessarily coaching. It's right. just helping them to be loose. So just to clarify what we mean by coaching, we're not, we don't want to get into the technicality of things. That is something that has to happen before the tournament. But we do want to get into the mental side of things, of swinging away, staying loose, um, being confident. And you can coach your partners on that. Coach, we say. but Or strategi- strategizing. Yeah, or strategizing. Strategizing is okay. Coaching is not okay. I guess we could say. Yeah. Or like, what, what hey, would you say? Sorry. Or like, hey, your part, you know, these opponents that we're playing, remember that dude on the right this time is left handed. I constantly have to be reminded of that. So yeah. that'd be a good <laughs> thing to tell your partner, hey, remember they're left handed. Because if not, sometimes you're popping one up right to their forehand and you're like, ah, oh, I forgot they were left handed. Yeah. So exactly. Anyway, that's one well, to avoid. Here's a question for you. So it's really devastating when you're down. Right, in a match, let's say you're down 1-6, for example, and you're playing to 15. You're down 1-6. Um, you guys are missing a ton of shots. What do you then say to your partner to amp them up? Because you can't give them a compliment, right? Because it, would be, it wouldn't be genuine. Obviously, they've been missing, you've been missing. What is your go-to strategy if you have one? Uh, I think there's two things. Have you noticed uh, when JW and Dylan play, for anyone not familiar with the pro scene, these are two extremely good pros. Um, They play relaxed. And have you noticed them sometimes between points laughing together at the baseline before they serve? I think I have, yeah. I think sometimes it helps to cut the tension and not even talk about something pickleball related. If you're down and you're not playing well is to just say something funny to help relax the other person or say something like well what do we got to lose or might as well swing away or you know say something jokingly if I can laugh before the next point then I'm a little more relaxed I don't care about and not thinking about the point before as much and I'm just focused on this point um, it seems like they do really well with that to reset. Just kind of laugh between the point and then go to the next one. But what do you do? I love that. I really like that. Uh, I'm going to do that now. That'll <laughs> definitely be one thing. But what what I do when we're down is amp up the partner genuinely by saying something like, like 
put me on your back. Um, and it's not to make them feel pressure. It's to help them because that automatically sends to their brain like, oh, put me on your back like I'm the best player here. Yeah. Automatically tells them that or just straight up telling them like, hey, you're the best player here. You're the one that can carry us out of this. Let's go. Swing away. Yeah. Something like that. So just amping up their ego, not necessarily saying like, hey, great shot because they didn't hit a great shot. They just <laughs> missed. But it's amping up the ego that will be able to help you. So, Yeah, mind games help just so much. I can think of a tournament. Uh, this was last year, mixed pro doubles. I was watching from right behind the baseline, and so I could hear the players. And oh, cool. Ben Johns and Annalie Waters were playing. I know that you watched some of that with me. Uh, maybe you were there for all of it. I don't remember. But between points, they were not talking about pickleball at all. I yeah. thought maybe like it, during a timeout or whatever, they were strategizing, you know, or, you know, talking about certain things that they should do. But they weren't. They were relaxing each other by hey, are you going, I don't remember the exact conversation, but are you going to such and such restaurant after this? Or uh, I remember specifically that I think they were talking about um, a song that she had listened to recently, that she really liked that song or something like that, that had nothing to do with pickleball, but seemed to relax both of them. And obviously they dominated. So I don't know, there's, a, there's another strategy yeah. too. That's cool. Yeah, because if you listen to any Ben Johns interview, he always says he tries to keep his mind relatively blank. He doesn't think about pickleball when he's playing pickleball. Yeah. Which I think is super important because you shut off that uh, logical part of your mind and you just allow the intellectual part of your mind or whatever it's called. You just allow the like the inner part of your mind that's, that's kind of... If you've ever been... The, way, the best way to describe it is, is if, if you've ever been driving, which everybody probably everybody that's listening has all of a sudden you just like are a couple miles past when you last were zoned in. Yeah. <laughs> if that makes sense. Like, how did I like, get here? How did I, yeah. How did I make it here? And so that's how <laughs> Ben Johns plays tournaments. He's like, Oh, I just won. Like, how did I make it here? Right. Technically like that. He's not thinking, okay, dink, dink. Uh, let's hit it over here. Let's hit it over there. He's just totally shut off, and the ball, because he's drilled so many times, his muscle memory is going to take over, put him in that flow state, and automatically have him hit the shots that he needs to hit. Yeah, and it's hard to get there at some point. It's hard to get there right away, but if you can get to that flow state, like you said, the best I've ever played in tournaments is when I can finally get to that flow state and that relaxed state, and it can happen to, it can happen to everybody. Um, another thing I was going to ask you was in what can people do? So again, you lost your first match of the day. Typically, if I lose my first match in a tournament, that's when the negative thoughts start to creep in a little bit. And it's like, whoo, we got a long day in front of us. You know, I wonder if we're you're just constantly thinking, I hope I don't go to and out. I hope I don't go to and out. And I think that's just coaching your brain to lose the next match. So what were you thinking after you lost your first match in order to get you, not only get you to the gold medal match, but then to actually win the gold medal match by the end of the day? But It was, is, it was actually funny because uh, in our first match, we knew the team that we were playing, so I talked some trash because I like to talk trash. And I said... Man, it's a shame they put the number one and two seed against each other the first round. Doesn't really make any sense, but I guess you guys will have to make it back out of the loser's bracket. <laughs> and, and, then they, and then they beat us, and I just played horrendous. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I'm not going to talk trash the rest of the day. That's not working today. And and then we ended up beating them in the fourth round, and I was like, I'm not saying a, a thing, okay? <laughs> um. But, yeah, so after we lost the first round, I just told Logan, like, hey, man, it's going to be a long day, uh, but we're coming back and we're winning this thing. I have zero doubt. And and he said the same exact thing. And, like, Logan going into the tournament, too, he's the underdog. He's not played 
really in any of these tournaments against any of these any of these guys, really. That's incredible. So, yeah, he was underestimated by everybody. And I, I'll say it right now, he outplayed me 100%, I think, the whole weekend. <laughs> I, I played not good until literally the semifinal. So he carried us to there. Um, but I think just keeping that mindset, he came in with just a total winner's mindset, too. And since we both had that, that's why we won. If one of us was disconnected there. That's why it's hard. you got to find a partner that is a winner. Because sometimes you get stuck with a partner, right, that just doesn't believe in themselves. And they're like, oh, why do I always choke? They'll say stuff like that. And I've played with players where they'll talk to me after and be like, like, why me? Why... Why wasn't I able to, why, why am I never able to win the tournament? And stuff yeah. like that. It's just like, that's not the mindset to have. And that's why you've never won a tournament. And they just don't realize that that's what they're doing. You just have to go in with like, hey, it didn't work out today. Kind of like our last podcast when we were talking with Stefan. It's like, what you have to look at, you're going to have a bad tournament every once in a while. It's just how it's going to go, but you want to see and make sure that the trend is just continuously going upwards, right? right? And then you know that what you're doing is right. So just keeping, got to end, had to end that call there. I was getting a call, but um, but yeah, keeping a, a good mindset and realizing that you're going to have a bad tournament every once in a while, not putting the the woe is me, like I can't win tournaments. And just saying, like, I can win tournaments. It was just a rough one. Like, just how it goes sometimes. Sometimes you don't play your best. Sometimes you get outplayed. And it's admitting that. And I think that's what bugs me the most about Rafael Nadal. Just to talk about tennis for one second. Yeah. Any, I mean, the guy's a total winner, right? But any time that he loses, he's a total loser. Uh, and what I mean by that is whenever he's in the post-match interview and they ask him, like, Rafa, what happened back there? And he's lost. He'd be like, well, I, I played bad. He'll never say that his par opponent played good. Yeah. Which I absolutely despise and hate. <laughs> it's like, obviously your opponent played pretty dang good if they beat you, right? Yeah. But he, yeah, that's just what bugs me about him. And that's what I love about Novak. He'll always give the credit to his opponent. Always. And he'll do it to his opponent, and then he'll do it in the post-match interview. Hmm. And so... I, I really like that about him, and I think that that's what we need to do, too, is just uh, just as a side note, when we lose in a tournament, just be like, hey, man, you played incredible, great job, and don't be like, I played so bad, I played so bad. Nobody wants to hear that. Right. Hey, let, let's finish this with two points on winning. Uh, like you just mentioned already, I don't know why birthday balloons just popped up. <laughs> I'm like, wait, is it, sep is it September 9th? <laughs> I was like, did I not wish him a happy birthday here? I literally thought that. We're Looks October, like you accidentally meanwhile. wished me a happy birthday over FaceTime. <coughs> anyway, so, I didn't even touch it. Two, two points on winning. So winner's mindset. Some people are winners and some people are not. And usually it's in the mind where that takes place. You have people with all the talent in the world, but if they can't have that winner's mindset, then they can't actually win, right? Yeah. And then one other point as far as winning goes, and you brought this up in the beginning, when you're, when you're down or when you're at the very end of this thing, if you, if you want to pull it out, you got to play to win. You got to continue to play your game and play to win. Don't play a specific way all tournament long and then at the end tighten up and and play not to lose. There's a difference between playing to win and playing not to lose and your strategy if you want to pick up win a pickleball tournament at any level should be playing to win, swinging away, uh, playing your your game. 100%. Yeah. Got to got to always play to win. It makes no sense to all of a sudden get into the semifinals or the finals and then tighten up and think that you're going to win that way just because you're like, "Oh, I'm nervous. I just don't want to miss." But it's easier said than done, and the best way to get better at it is through experiencing it. So I think that wraps everything up, right? 
Absolutely. Love hey. it. Well, we appreciate you guys listening, and we'll see you next time.